The doomsday clock moves humanity closer to catastrophe. In setting the clock closer to midnight, we send a stark signal. Because the world is already perilously close to the precipice, how atomic scientists determined the symbolic but serious assessment. We first ask ourselves, uh, should we move the clock? And if there is a consensus that we move the clock, then we say in which direction and how much. Today is Tuesday, January 28th. And this is The Issue from VOA. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori London. Scott has the day off. It is now 89 seconds to midnight. This is the closest the world has ever been to midnight. Scientists on Tuesday moved the hands on the so-called doomsday clock. It is the determination of the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists that the world has not made sufficient progress on existential risks threatening all of humanity. We thus move the clock forward. Daniel Holes is chair of the group Science and Security Board, made up of scientists and other experts in nuclear technology and climate science, and even 13 Nobel laureates, all of whom determine where to place the hands of the clock each year. Any move towards midnight should be taken as an indication of extreme danger and an unmistakable warning. Every second of delay in reversing course increases the probability of global disaster. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists was created in 1947 during Cold War tensions following World War II. It was meant to warn the public about how close humankind was to destroying the world. Albert Einstein was actually one of its founding scientists. Joining us now for insights into how the group came to this year's decision is Herb Lynn, a member of the Bulletin Science and Security Board and a research scholar at Stanford University. Thanks so much for being with us. Tell us a little bit about the process of how these group of experts, including yourself, come to the decision on what the doomsday clock will be. It's a collective decision that the, uh, that the board itself takes. Um, so we have nuclear experts and we have climate experts, you know, and so on and so forth. And we have, uh, and the, the process is that, is that we first ask ourselves, uh, should we move the clock? And if there is a consensus that we move the clock, then we say in which direction and how much. Those are two separate decisions. You know, we went around the room uh, and uh, said, should the clock be moved? And we had a spirited discussion. Uh, in which you know some people say we should move it x seconds, and some people say x minus two seconds or x plus two seconds or whatever you know whatever it is. And we eventually hammer out a uh, a consensus. Then the question is, what do you take into account? And the one question is that we ask is, are we safer this year than we were last year? And uh, taking into account the, the second question is taking into account the history uh, of the clock, you know, in a historical perspective. Uh, how does you know, how, how, how do events this year correspond to the lab, you know, correspond to any change that we might want to make? So, for example, um, a, uh, when we last moved the clock from 100 seconds to 90 seconds, uh, that was in 2022. And we responded at that time to the beginning of the war in Ukraine, which was uh, accompanied by a variety of nuclear threats that Putin made. And we moved it 10 seconds. And I mean, nobody said that we should move the clock back right? so in, in the last year. Uh, so it was only either stay the same or go forward. And the people who said go forward, or, you know, there are some people who say that, you know, we, we should move it forward by a lot or a little. But, you know, nothing, we, we sort of thought about it and said that last year, you know, the last time we moved it, 10 sec we moved it 10 seconds because of the war in Ukraine. Is there anything in the last year that has been that's comparable to that? The answer was no. So whatever it was, it was going to be less than 10 seconds. So that leaves you, you know, with a choice if you're going to move it forward, you know, a choice, you know, one through nine. And to make the argument, it, it, nine, nine and eight are pretty close to 10. And so, you know, it, nothing happened that was sort of remotely comparable to the, you know, starting a war with nuclear threats. 
So that sort of pushed you down towards the, the the lower end of it, and so you know we 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 tossed it around and we settled on on, on one second. Now, why one second? Okay, the last time we changed it was in 2022. Um, how could you move it only one second? Well, the answer was the you know what we thought was that we were more concerned with actions than with words. Okay, and that was a that was a big deal. So you could make an argument, for example. Uh, we didn't we didn't talk about this publicly in the in today's uh, session, but to make an argument, for example, that Trump is the you know is the sort of person who could bring it, bring home a, a kind of Nixon goes to China kind of a, a moment where Trump could actually deliver a deal, good arms control deal. I mean, he fancies himself as a good negotiator. He is, and if he can do that, more power to him. That would be great. But he hasn't done anything yet there, and you know he might. So you know, there's a lot. There's lots that, that's unknown. Let's see what happens after a year. What are the the considerations specifically that are considered in the clock setting? The, the threats that we look at are one, nucle- the nuclear threat. What has happened in the world of, of nuclear with respect to nuclear weapons? Uh, that has made the world more le- more dangerous or less dangerous. Uh, second thing is uh, what has the, the the second climate topic is climate change. Has the world taken any action that pushes it, or has anything happened that pushes it, the world into a more dangerous or less dangerous state with respect to climate change? That is, are, are we taking actions to reverse the bad indicators that signal that uh, a climate uh, you know drastic time climate change is coming? And so, you know, that's another consideration. So, for example, on, on, on the second one, uh, we looked at, for example, we mentioned it during the press conference that the price of renewables has dropped significantly. And lots of people are going to that, are, are going to renewables um, sort of all by themselves voluntarily. That's a good thing. People respond to my market. That's a good thing. But it's not sufficient to offset the other inactions that have happened about, you know, things that we have failed to do. So it's largely, in the climate change world, it's largely uh, what we look at is a failure to do certain things that are necessary. We hadn't seen anything as, uh, I think we'd argue that we hadn't seen anything as significant as Ukraine, because one of the protagonists in there is the the, the country that has the largest number of nuclear weapons in the world. And the Ukraine conflict was was much more dangerous from from that perspective. It seems pretty ominous, even if it is a symbolic warning. We think it's very concerning that it says that we are on the wrong path and we're closer to disaster than we've ever been. Initially, the clock was set because it was, the, the, the primary concern was that, uh, was nuclear weapons. And with nuclear weapons, that was in the tenure of the, the doomsday clock before it, it expanded its reef, the world got up to 70,000 nuclear weapons, Okay, which was a large number of nuclear weapons. That was that was a big deal. The clock was only concerned about the number of nuclear weapons. In 2007, I believe, long before I came on board, the bulletin decided that it was going to include climate change as a, another existential threat. Now, climate change has a, is a different kind of existential threat. Climate change doesn't portend a billion people dying in two weeks, uh, but it does portend. You know, if, if left unaddressed and if all the trends continue there, it does portend a world that is significantly different, very, very disruptively different than uh, what we've been used to. So we said that, that, you know, it's existential in the sense that it's hugely disruptive to uh, to, to, to society. Lots of people are going to have to move. There's going to be, uh, you know, away from coastlines. There's going to be increased famine and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot more human misery. Than, uh, than, than was there before. Then we have this category of, of, of biological threats that uh, has, has come out as you know, normally as, a, as an outgrowth of our work in uh, disruptive technologies where we just monitor things, uh, see if they're going to become significant. Bio threats, you know, we, we, we saw the, we, we are now seeing the emergence of bio threats, which the COVID uh, pandemic was just an example. Now, this is a threat that comes from Mother Nature. But uh, as it turns out, we're dismantling the entire infrastructure that we need to to cope with such threats. So that's not a that's that's not a good thing either. And you can you can clearly see how how uh, biological threats could in fact be an existential threat. And then you know you wor- then there are people who are worrying about AI and uh, disinformation and so on. I mean, I pers- speaking for myself, I I personally believe that uh, the threat from from disinformation and chaos in the information ecosystem is an existential threat. I'm not speaking for the bold mayor, I'm speaking for myself. 
um, because it means that we're, we'll be unable to distinguish between uh, truth and lies. That's a terrible consequence for dealing with any other threat, and it's also bad in itself. That also you know, changes the nature of the society in which you and I live. You know, in a world in which there are no facts, that's a, that's a bad thing. What would the clock potentially look like if the hands moved to midnight? It, it's metaphorical. You know, will we ever get to midnight? I don't know how to answer that question. I put a, a, a bracket on that and say the world as we know it. Okay? We, we, we've been in a world, we've been in a world of, uh, which has sort of been, you know, struggling through problems and so on. And there have been, you know, good, honest people trying to, to work out political differences and so on and so forth uh, in trying to solve the problems of the world. And although we may have differed on, on our solutions, uh, we at least agreed on the nature of the problem. We agreed that there was a problem. And now, and, now, and now all of that is called into question. Thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate your insights. That was Herb Lin. He's a member of the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and a research scholar at Stanford University. You've been listening to The Issue from the Voice of America. On behalf of Scott Walterman and all of us here at VOA, thanks so much for joining us. You can follow the issue on X, Blue Sky, and Facebook at VOA The Issue. And for news 24 hours a day, check out our website at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Lori London. We'll talk to you tomorrow.